Hello, everyone. Everyone, it's uh, Larry Kotlikoff. I'm uh, running the podcast Economics Matters, the podcast. And today I have a very interesting guest, Hani Findakli, who um, I met just recently. He's fascinating. Uh, let me give you his uh, short bio, and then we're going to uh, get a longer description of how he did all the things that he's done. Uh, but he's an investment banker uh, who has served as chief investment officer of the World Bank Group. Uh, and just think about that. The World Bank is a very big organization. The CIO, the chief investment, they have a lot of money to invest. Uh, becoming the chief investment officer is not a minor thing to happen. Uh, he served in senior positions at uh, Wall Street, including vice chairman of the Clinton Group, uh, chairman of Dylan Reed Management, CEO of Potomac, Potomac BAPS, and managing director of Payne Weber. Managing director of Payne Weber. This is, uh, I'm not sure whether Payne Weber is still with us, but Payne Weber is, it was a huge company, a bit, very important Wall Street player when I was uh, younger. He's senior vice. He's been senior vice president, head of global markets for Drexel, Burn and Lambert. I don't believe they're with us anymore. But that again was a very notable Wall Street firm. Prior to uh, going to Wall Street, uh, Hani served on the faculty of MIT and the Catholic University in Rio de Janeiro, uh, in Brazil. Uh, he serves on several corporate and academic bo boards, including he's a trustee of the American University. Of Sharja and member of the International Board of Beijing University and the Beijing Forum. Uh, he has served, among other things, on the boards of the Middle East Institute, the U U.S. Department of State Advisory Committee on International Finance. Uh, he's also been on the, several boards in the U.S. and Middle East. Currently, he's an advisor to the Ministry of Investment in Saudi Arabia. Think about that, Ministry of Investment in Saudi Arabia, he's an advisor a graduate of Baghdad University. So he's from Iraq. We'll talk about his background, how he came to the US. And uh, he graduated with a, uh, the BSc, summa cum laude, in civil engineering from, the, from Baghdad University. And then he received his master's of science in operations research and doctorate of science uh, in decision theory from MIT. So it goes from Baghdad University to MIT. It's not an everyday event. Uh, they probably they probably take one person from Iraq, maybe even zero people from Iraq on a typical basis. Uh, he's a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a recipient of several academic and research honors. In particular, he's a recipient of the 2009 Ellis Island Medal of Honor. And if any immigrant to the U.S. Uh, has achieved more than you have, I'd like to know about it. Uh, maybe there there have been, uh, but um, uh, but this is an enormous, fantastic uh, bio. Hani, welcome to Economics Matters, the podcast. Great to have you. Tell everybody a little more about your background. You know where you grew up exactly, and you know your family when you went to college and in, in Baghdad University. What things were like. Well, was this under Saddam Hussein? Exactly what point do you, uh, what year do you get here to the US and uh, how you moved from the world of engineering and operations research to the world of investment banking and to being on in, in so many places. Uh, in, and now I know that you're currently highly involved with uh, uh, international relations and you were just came back from a, an important trip to China, uh, interacting with people from the government, but also the Beijing University. So go ahead, take it away. Very good. Thanks very much, uh, Larry, for <clears throat> uh, giving me a chance to talk. I think you exaggerate my my achievements. Uh, this is a country of immigrants that have made a difference to this, uh, uh, to the society, and I play a very small you know, part of it and hope to, <clears throat> to build on that. Uh, as you said, I grew up in Iraq. I um, went to uh, public school and to Jesuit school in, in Baghdad and uh, graduated from uh, College of Engineering. 
uh, worked for a short period of time, got a scholarship to uh, go to MIT and uh, <laughs> stayed there for several years, including doing my graduate studies and teaching for a couple of years before I joined the World Bank. So that is a short uh, short order. <laughs> How I got into finance was probably by accident. I had done a lot of work on risk management uh, <laughs> in my studies and operations research. And um, I came to the World Bank through a program called the Young Professionals Program that uh, McNamara, who was then uh, president of the World Bank, had brought from uh, from the Pentagon. So this year this is year. what what year are we, we talking? Well, uh, I joined the World Bank in 1975. Okay. Uh, so I <clears throat> I left Iraq in 1968. So that was before uh, Saddam Hussein had taken over. <laughs> I, okay. missed, uh, I missed some of the excitements uh, <laughs> during that time. Uh, <clears throat> I had done some work on, uh, on risk management. And when I joined the World Bank, I joined through this uh, program called the Young Professionals Program basically taking young people under the age of 30 who, who've had strong academic achievements and rotate them through the organization so they can learn different aspects of the work. Right, uh, the YP program is still in exi existence and you go through- Still different... in existence. It's, yeah. uh, it was a very uh, selective program. They have like three or 4,000 applicants a year and they get about 20 or 25 a year. Uh, so it's a very competitive and very selective program. And uh, it's, a, it's a very fortunate program because it allows you to see all aspects of the organization and then you get to select where you end up. And I ended up in, in, in investments and finance and worked through the ranks in a few years. <laughs> well, so, so then from there, you, uh, you went from running World Bank's investment portfolio to going to Wall Street to work on Wall Street? That is correct. So I, I run, uh, because of my background, I work mostly in international divisions of uh, Wall Street firms and ran the international division for Drexel when I first uh, left the World Bank and then uh, I joined Dylan Reid uh, and uh, Payne Weber. Payne Weber, by the way, was acquired by uh, uh, UBS, Union Bank of Switzerland. Right. So I became part of a, a very large international organization. And so as a uh, as head of international division in these firms, I ran a pretty good sizable group of people, very talented. At some point, I had like you know, about 12, 1300 employees worldwide and several different corporate entities divided between Asia and Europe and, <laughs> and Latin America. So that was the uh, that was the uh, uh, work I did after I joined. Oh, so 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 this group was uh, doing private wealth uh, management primarily. Was that it? Was pretty much uh, more of an investment banking and trading and, uh, and rather than uh, wealth management. I see. So you're then, I, then I joined the. Uh, uh, I started a small company called Potomac. Economic capital, which was managing funds uh, for central banks and international organizations, and then that was acquired by a subsidiary of Mass Mutual, David L. Bapt, and I joined that uh, that board, and that was the uh, last part of my active <laughs> active career. So, during this period where you were involved in investment um, projects, so. Uh, uh, for for me and for the people uh, watching and listening, are we talking about a typical project being some factory gets built in some country and you finance it? Or are we talking about some government highway that gets financed by uh, Drexel or Payne Weber or... Um, Give us a give us a feel for that. Uh, yeah, it was more like uh, acquiring and uh, or, or restructuring um, uh, companies that did these kind of. Uh, so there were companies that were involved in manufacturing and trading and retailing and across the board. I so it was more of more of a corporate management and corporate structuring and corporate acquisition and mergers rather than the uh, <coughs> projects themselves. I got it. Yes, I see. So it's that 
So it's a company comes to you for financing and you end up maybe taking it over or making a loan to it or investing with in it uh, direct directly. I see. Okay. All raising money for them. All raising money for them. Yeah. And then, and then you, um, so after you re, kind of retire from that line of work, you become involved in your own lots of boards. You how did the association with the University of Beijing arise? Well, I had been involved in, um, uh, in with China for quite some time. Uh, when I was with the World Bank, um, I was involved in some of the discussions and negotiation that brought China into the World Bank and into the IMF, the Bretton Woods system. Uh, so I had an early look into uh, China of the 1970s, 1980s, still very primitive and very uh, poor economy. And over the course of uh, uh, many, uh, many years, uh, I had joined the board of a couple of companies that had a diversified in investments uh, worldwide. Uh, these were mostly in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, and I was instrumental in bringing them to look at China uh, as a, an investment uh, focus. Uh, and that brought me more actively uh, in the meantime, uh, having retired from day-to-day -day management uh, uh, and having served on a few boards, I began to get interested and put more of my efforts into the field of education, supporting um, educational efforts, joining boards of a few universities. And uh, so <clears throat> the Peking University, which is the oldest and uh, probably the most, one of the most prestigious universities over there, invited me to join their board as an international uh, board members, not being Chinese and not being a member of the Communist Party. Uh, it was more of an international advisory board as compared to a board of trustees. Uh, but in the process, I've also been involved in a number of universities uh, uh, here in the US, uh, UCLA, University of Maryland, and by extension, some of the universities in the Middle East uh, included uh, American University of Cairo, and as you uh, mentioned, uh, American University of Sharjah. Sharjah, by the way, is um, one of the Emirates that's located next to Dubai. And uh, it's, a, it's a third largest uh, emirate in the United Arab Emirates, uh, and probably one that uh, has uh, a very unique um, history uh, as the center for the UAE was as, as a trading center, as a cultural center. And it has uh, a ruler who's been, I think, uh, ruling for about 40 or 50 years, uh, whose primary focus was on education and invested quite a bit of the uh, Emirates budget and resources in supporting uh, education. So he's got uh, almost 20, 30% of the budget <laughs> on education. And I think you've had some run-in with some of them over the last uh, last few months. Yeah, that's an amazing contribution, I'm, I'm sure, to, that, to the country. So you've been at this very interesting I intersection of the Arab world and China, and now we're seeing the Arab world and China, at least you know, it's probably been it's probably been close close connections that have been occurring for years that uh, the typical American would not know about because it's just not public. But now we see China uh, brokering a, a peace agreement uh, between or normalization of relations between Ar Iran and Saudi Arabia that came out of the really out of the blue from my perspective. Uh, so give us uh, uh, your sense of uh, the Chinese Arab world uh, relationship, where how it's evolved, where it's going, how this connects to the US, you know, is this pushing the US out of the Middle East? Uh, you know, I'd also like to get your feeling, your sense of the uh, U.S. policy over the last 30 years in the Middle East and, uh, you know, was it misdirected, misguided, correctly, on target? Did we make 
do some right, correct things, some wrong things. You know, give us um, the whole perspective and where you see things going into the future. Well, uh, it's quite interesting that actually China and the Arab world have been connected for over 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years, since the Han Dynasty, but turn of the millennium uh, or first millennium. Uh, that uh, became known uh, as the Silk Road, where uh, trade uh, and uh, flows of uh, commerce and uh, people uh, flourished uh, for you know almost uh, almost seven eight hundred years. Uh, a revival of that, the Chinese uh, called the Silk and uh, sorry the Belt and Road Initiative, which was initially called the New Silk Road. Uh, was a, w- a way for Chinese to reconnect um, uh, with the rest of the world and basically restore historical uh, trade and economic ties between the Far East and the Middle East. So it uh, became almost a natural um, uh, phenomenon with the rise of China, uh, the production of relatively cheap uh, products and, and uh, services. China became uh, more and more uh, deeply involved in the region to a point where uh, trade uh, now accounts for almost 10% of the entire uh, GDP of the Arab. Chinese are very long-term thinkers. They look at the Arab world as a, both in geopolitical and uh, economic terms, the region uh, that currently has about 400 million population that projected by my estimate to exceed a billion people uh, for the end of the century. Pretty soon, yeah, 80 years, right? Uh, Less than that, yes. And um, at the same time, it's uh, although it's disjointed in several countries, there's a lot of uh, bonds that that pull them together. Uh, The collective GDP right now is about uh, $3 trillion, $3.1 trillion, which is about the same size of the economy of India. And yet, it's been ignored by by the U.S. and by uh, by uh, Europeans, with the exception of weapon sales, as a target. The Chinese see that in much different ways, uh, and uh, have now account now account for over twelve or fourteen percent of the entire GDP of the region in terms of trade. Uh, investments are still lagging a little bit in terms of amounts. Uh, but they're catching up. So, uh, you know, where money flows, uh, social and political ties um, uh, <laughs> begin to develop, and the Chinese have been building um, for the last 30, 40 years, uh, very strong ties uh, with the region. Uh, and uh, so what you refer to as sort of the last, uh, the last attempt by China to broker uh, a peace agreement uh, between, uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, was a way of their exerting influence and using a, a, a very strategic uh, a way of thinking to, to bring this uh, agreement together. And, and tell us about... You know, is this for real or is this kind of, um, uh, you know, a few years ago we had um, the oil, a big oil installation in Saudi Arabia being uh, attacked by missiles that people felt were had come from Iran. Uh, now we have a peace agreement. Uh, we also have concerns about the development of a nuclear weapon in Iran. Saudi Arabia doesn't have a nuclear weapon. Uh, we've got the Sunni Shia uh, divide. This is it seems like a, a huge sea change to have these two countries come together. Is this for real? What are the implications for the nuclear, you know, for, for Iran uh, acquiring a, a nuclear weapon? Is this a, a, a good thing for, for the, for the, for the world, or is this? Um, I mean, it must be a good. I mean, that making peace is always a good thing, but well, yeah, making peace is a good thing, and it's hard to know whether it's for real or not. Uh, my own view is that uh, uh, I think the region is tired of uh, wars and conflict. Uh, the Saudis uh, 
uh, and their neighbors uh, to the east, the UAE, have been engaged in a war in Yemen that has cost them a bit of money. And YSM is being in the range of about 20 to 30 billion dollars per year over the course of now almost 10 years. That's quite a bit of drain on, on resources. Uh, the conflict with Iran. Iran has been a troublemaker uh, uh, in the region for a long time. Uh, even before the, uh, the religious hierarchy took over in 1980. But I think the Saudis have come to the conclusion that, um, uh, you know, their neighbor is going to be there for the next <laughs> thousand years. It's been there for the last thousand years. Uh, so they're going to have to find a way to, uh, to coexist. Uh, the Chinese uh, actually use a very clever and, and very insightful way to bring about this uh, agreement. Uh, the Saudis have been negotiating with Iran for at least the last several years, four or five years, maybe longer. Uh, they had uh, their delegations meeting in secret in Baghdad and in Muscat and, and discussing a variety of uh, uh, different ways to do it. They had reached pretty much an agreement on uh, on most things where you know both sides were giving in on something by gaining something else, but they could not. Uh, trust each other. Uh, they did not have a, an intermediary who could help, uh, maybe not enforce, but you know, uh, increase the odds of uh, people sticking to their their uh, uh, sides of the bargain. The U.S. could not be because uh, it has a uh, you know conflict with Iran. Uh, Europe doesn't have the power, uh, economic or otherwise, to enforce it. So China became a natural uh, choice for both sides. Uh, it's the only uh, economic uh, force that is helping uh, Iran survive from collapse. Uh, it's one that the Saudis, I think, trust uh, because of their relationship and because of the track record. China does not have a, uh, a record of invading uh, countries and occupying them and whatever, uh, despite the uh, Issues currently with the, with the Taiwan, uh, so the uh, Chinese basically looked at it in a very strategic way. Uh, what does Iran need uh, the most, and what can it give up uh, without impacting its overall, uh, you know, sort of macro uh, objective? And they looked at the same time on the Saudis. What did they need the most, and what what are they willing to give without having to give up? A lot, uh, and it turned out to be a very simple, uh, simple formula. Uh, uh, the war in Yemen uh, has now reached a stand here without any solution, without any prospect uh, of a solution. Uh, the Iranians have been feeding uh, the insurgency in in, in Yemen, uh, but it was not a strategically important um, important uh, objective. So the Saudis wanted. But the Iranians didn't care that by giving it up. Uh, so that was half of the agreement. The other is what does Iran want the most, and that is economic uh, relief from the sanctions, trade, and investment. And the Saudis have it, uh, and it doesn't cost them an awful lot for doing that. Uh, so that's how this uh, this agreement came about. It was pretty straightforward uh, strategic thinking, uh, so, so and, and being and being a trusted partner. And, and so the Saudis are giving up arming certain groups in Yemen, uh, and the uh, sorry the the Iranians are giving up that, and the Saudis are giving are starting to trade uh, with Iran in, I guess, uh, in opposition to the uh, sanctions that the U.S. and others have imposed on Iran. Uh, that's the agreement. If I'm Describing it correctly, correct? That's, that's basically it. So we, we seem to have lost you. That is basically it, yes. Yeah, that's it. So how do you how does this impact uh Saudi Iran's development of nuclear weapon? What's your sense of the Saudis' concern about that? Uh, are they going to go off and build their own nuclear weapon? Or the Saudi are the Iranians going to step back from uh, going the last stage to, you know, fully enriching uranium and then putting it onto a missile. Where do you see? Uh, do you see this as the kind of the beginning of normalization of Saudi of Iran 
backing away from developing a nuclear weapon and trying to normalize relations more broadly with the US and Europe. Uh, is this a good sign for world peace? I mean, I, I can't tell you what, what the Iranians' uh, intentions are. Uh, I have no doubt that the uh, uh, part of the discussion was about the uh, Iranian <laughs> nuclear development. Uh, the Saudis uh, and the Egyptians have for long argued that they <laughs> that they themselves will move towards uh, uh, developing nuclear capability if everybody around them is have it. Israel has it, if the Iranians have it, then they're going to be surrounding, surrounded by uh, nuclear powers. My, my suspicion is that this probably uh, commitment on the part of the Iranians uh, that they will not enrich uh, beyond the current level. Remember, the, uh, the initial agreement between the U.S. and Iran that included the uh, five permanent members of the United Nations ceremony uh, had reached an agreement uh, called the JCPOA, I think, Joint Cooperative uh, Plan of Action. Uh, that was supposed to put nuclear uh, development in Iran on hold for 10 years uh, and keep the enrichment level to 20%. Uh, when the Trump administration decided to cancel that and withdraw from that, against the opposition of the Europeans and the other members of the, the group, uh, allowed the Iranians to uh, enrich to now almost six. Uh, I have a feeling that this was part of the discussion, and uh, I don't think it's in the interest of China itself to see Iran uh, becoming power. So it's quite possible that that is the case, but I don't have enough uh, knowledge about the, uh, the actual details of the discussion. Is it? Yeah. Do you think that the issue of the, the, the Uyghurs and, and the treatment of Muslims in uh, China has been part of the discussion, part of the relationship with, with or do you think both sides have said, we're not going to get into each other's internal affairs? Any, any reaction? That's it. That's, it. That's the answer. Okay. Everybody's turning a blind eye to their own, <laughs> their to own uh, behaviors. Yeah. That's right. And how how does the U.S. Um, you know what is your view of? I think uh, or my sense is that China has been turned into a boogeyman by Trump and other politicians in the U.S. Uh, but it's also engaged in certain actions which give us great concern about the, you know developing a military presence in the South China Sea, claiming it to be its its. Um, its property um, being aggressive with respect, more aggressive with respect to Taiwan. Uh, you see China blundering here in this relationship with the West. We're now kind of in kind of a form of a kind of a cold war. Uh, we still, everybody still wants to trade with each other, but um, uh, you know, the US is uh, concerned that China wants to become the hegemon, the world hegemon, that that's their long run goal, that they have no qualms about stealing technology from US, the US, from US companies, and that uh, they're developing a Navy at a super high you know, pace, and that at some point they will physically take over uh, Taiwan, and then we may get into a shooting war with them uh, you know, where do you, where do you, you know, does the U.S. have, is the storyline that's being uh, conveyed by politicians starting with Trump, and Trump, I view as, you know, not a responsible personality, person because it's, it's not clear that anything he says is either true or sensible, makes any sense. Um, I, I think, you know, I view him as a traitor to the country. Uh, and his recent behavior and indictment uh, provide additional. I think I'm the first person who described him in, as a traitor in black and white and in print because uh, uh, he's you know engaged in such activity and so so adverse to American norms and and our constitution. But 
you know, that doesn't mean that everything that Trump said or did uh, or that the Republican Party supported. Uh, I mean, you have the Democratic Party in, in pretty much in lockstep with what the Trump administration uh, set forth in terms of tariffs. Uh, and, cons- and, and so the question is uh, about U.S. policy towards China, leaving out the personalities of the Biden and Trump, and uh, just as you see uh, these two superpowers, is the U.S. Be, being too aggressive? Is China being too aggressive? Is there a way that we can that the situation can calm down? You know, we had Blinken makes this. Uh, hopefully, uh, could view that as a successful trip. The next day, President Biden refers to uh, Xi as a dictator. Maybe that was just a you know misstatement, or I mean, obvious. Obviously, one can view, uh, take that position. Their their demo, their system of government is different from ours. They could call us. Uh, you know, nobody has the the perfect definition of a democracy, and we have lots of problems with our democracy. Uh, so anyway, just just uh, kind of elucidate us on your sense of the U.S. Chinese relationship. And also, the U.S. is the U.S.'s uh, future in the Middle East. Well, okay, so uh, uh, let's hold a whole bunch of stuff to uh, talk about. Um, uh, on the last point you made about democracy, uh, uh, I've always argued that uh, the word democracy does not appear in the U.S. Constitution. It was not in the Declaration of Independence. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, having read through uh, some of the Federalist Papers, the word democracy (laughs) does not appear uh, anywhere. So it's a relatively new invention, mostly, uh, I think, Bush second administration. Uh, The uh, Chinese um, uh, are driven by um, uh, a couple of of forces. Uh, the most important of which uh, is what they call the uh, century of humiliation. Uh, the period from the 1840s uh, up until the early 1900s, maybe mid-1900s, where uh, China was uh, invaded, occupied, uh, dismembered, uh, uh, and what have you. Uh, they, were tried, they were forced to try to uh, buy... <laughs> Uh, drugs and all sorts of things, and and they were bombed uh, for refusing to do doing so. Uh, that period, uh, basically the century from mid eighteen hundreds to uh, mid nineteen hundreds until the China Communist uh, was considered to be a dark history in otherwise five thousand years of glorious China. Uh, the Chinese don't want to see this repeated. And, and therefore, they are super sensitive uh, to any anything that could uh, uh, could hit, hint at uh, superpowers imposing their wills on China. Having said that, uh, China today is different than China 40 or 50 years ago. What China was able to achieve uh, in the last uh, in the last 40 or 50 years uh, has never really been achieved before. I mean, uh, you look at uh, the fact that its uh, per capita GDP was close to about 600 or so uh, in the 1960s and now close to 11,000, maybe even more. Uh, it's a remarkable achievement. So uh, any of my American friends who think that the Chinese are going to rebel against the government, having seen their... <laughs> Their wealth and income blocked twenty times uh, has uh, has some uh, you know <laughs> misplaced ideas of how how people think and what they want and what their priorities. Uh, having said that, uh, there's no question that China is much more assertive today than it was thirty forty years ago, uh, and whether that is because of the power and wealth that China has been able to achieve. Uh, and how it sees its uh, position in the world, or whether this is the personality of uh, a sort of leader like Xi Jinping. I don't know. I think it's probably a combination of both. Uh, But uh, that means that we need to find a way to uh, live with, uh, uh, with rising China. 
uh, China's uh, economy is uh, probably on, on path to uh, surpass the U.S., uh, but that doesn't mean a whole lot because uh, the population is four, four times ours, and they have their own challenges. Uh, they have a demographic uh, challenge, they have uh, economic growth challenge, and then they have the uh, uh, geopolitical. They are very committed uh, to unifying China with, uh, with Taiwan. Uh, they have uh, uh, taken back uh, Hong Kong after almost 100 years of occupation or a bit more. Uh, and they're committed to uh, bring ta uh, Taiwan back to, uh, to the fall. Uh, now, uh, that doesn't mean uh, U US thinking is always that if we want to get something done, we need to get it done in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, Mm -hmm. Chinese think in, in, in very different terms. They think about a century or two or whatever it is. So they're, they're willing to wait it out uh, and will do it. I think the idea that China will invade Taiwan uh, next month or, or, or whatever uh, is ludicrous. And I don't see it in my discussion with uh, people uh, that is being imminent. Only thing that could trigger and, and move this uh, calendar up very quickly uh, is if the U.S. or Taiwan or both uh, take steps that will reverse uh, the and uh, create a, a, a full independence for Taiwan uh, and reverse the uh, Nixon uh, One China policy, uh, then the probably they will move. Uh, but that is only my guess. Is there? Do you see a? I don't know if you've been to Taiwan, but we've talked to the um, leadership there, but it seems to me if I'm Taiwanese, uh, they're not spending that big a share of their GDP on defense. I think it's only 2 to 2%. 2 so uh, I would presume that they think it's inevitable that they also become part of China. Why can't they, why can't the two sides come up with some kind of transition plan where this happens and and the Chinese can go back to trading. And, you know, I've written a paper, it's like kotlikoff.net, my website uh, with some colleagues from, from Russia and also grad students from the US uh, that uh, one of whom is Chinese, which looks at uh, the projections, the demographics, but also the growth per capita growth out to the end of the century, China ends up with about a third of the world GDP. The U.S. is about 12%. Uh, uh, that's under conservative per capita GDP growth assumptions, productivity, worker productivity growth assumptions. Uh, if, if you take uh, the most more recent history of Chinese uh, uh, growth, uh, it, it would be even a higher share. And so the U.S. Uh, ability to, to maintain kind of its hegemonic position in the world really is, is kind of, uh, unless China's, uh, even though they're going to lose 400 million people, according to the U.N.'s demographic projections by the end of the century and be a very old country, they're going to have uh, so many productive people that are uh, unless their productivity suddenly stops on the dime, uh, I don't see that happening. They are going to be the new, the superpower. They and India together will probably control about 45% of world trade, world, world GDP, sorry, world GDP. So we have to, it seems to me, accommodate that reality. If they're going to be such a big country, two and a half times our GDP, they're going to have two and a half times our military, I would think, at some point. Um, and yes, we can band together with other countries and collectively uh, be stronger militarily. But this, to me, does not, you know, being in conflict with a country that's going to have that potential future uh, and trying to stop them economically uh, uh, by, you know, trying to keep it, maintain uh their you know eliminate the their ability to buy chips and uh, uh which is what our current policy is it just seems like it's more or less hopeless 
given the realities of when when you go to China and you see what Shanghai looks like and what it looked like 15, 20 years ago, and you compare that with what even Boston looks like and what our infrastructure looks like. And, you know, uh, I, I just think uh, we need to change the conversation in a uh, in a different in light of that reality, China is not Russia. And uh, uh, do you see any any prospect of us of the two sides coming together? Are the personalities too strong? Is the has the rhetoric been too hot? Uh, where where do you see things? Uh, well, going? Um, a, a number a number of comments. One is uh, um, I think quite a bit of. Uh, the outcome of how our relationship uh, is going to evolve uh, will probably depend as much on the U.S. as it does on China, but probably more so uh, on the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, China has not had a history of invading countries. In fact, it's always been invaded by outsiders uh, all along. Uh, so it's... Um, uh, the use of the terms hegemony, I think, probably does not apply to China, uh, at least uh, in terms of its 5,000 year history, whether it will change at the next, next 500 years, I don't know, but it doesn't look like it is uh, in the offing. Uh, that's number one. Number two, in terms of the projection of populations, and, and uh, they're very aware of the demographics and they're taking steps to doing that, but I doubt, doubt very much that it will result in any kind of, uh, uh, you know, restoring normal growth. Uh, but they're not as, as uh, uh, anxious uh, about the issue of population because they believe that there are other ways that they can, uh, they can, uh, uh, they can, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, balance that. Uh, China still has very low immigration. In fact, its immigration uh, <laughs> policy is such that number of immigrants uh, into China, other than Chinese, probably smaller as a percentage of population than Afghanistan. So it's not, a, it's not a very uh, uh, receptive to uh, to. Uh, <clears throat> To immigrants, uh, but uh, they are looking at options of doing it without having to worry about the you know, behind majority of population. Two is that if you look at the Chinese budget, as we have been discussing and debating investment in infrastructure, anybody who's been to China in the last five or 10 years or more recently knows that they're at least 100 years ahead of us in terms of we're building uh, one new airport a month. Uh, they were, uh, if you look at their, uh, their airports, roads, uh, railroads, uh, high speed uh, uh, transportation, uh, they are way ahead of where we are. Uh, we uh, passed the CHIPS Act, uh, which is pretty pretty important um, uh, act to balance off uh, China's uh, technological advance. Uh, but China has. Uh, uh, Announce its uh, five, uh, three to five year uh, plan. And uh, it looks very different than their plans of the last uh, 30 or 40 years. China's, uh, the composition of China's economy uh, is uh, beginning to shift. Growth forces that drove China's uh, growth in the last uh, 20 or 30 years uh, real estate, housing, uh, and exports uh, that contributed to almost 40, 45% of GDP uh, are likely to shrink. Uh, the focus is gonna be uh, on uh, on two, uh, two primary uh, forces, uh, digital technology and green uh, technology. Uh, so uh, they are, uh, they've uh, allocated $1.4 trillion. That's about three times spending on technology, uh, to digital technology and to, uh, uh, to green technology. Right now they're producing half of all electric vehicles in the, uh, in the world. There are 300 Chinese companies uh, producing variety of electric, uh, electric vehicles. Um, and probably they will consolidate, but they uh, see that uh, by somewhere in the, uh, 
middle of the century, 20, 2025, uh, a third to a half of their uh, uh, cars on the road are electric vehicles. Uh, and that stimulates a whole new investment that they're going to make. I was in Saudi Arabia just recently. There was a conference on uh, China-Arab economic ties, trade and economic. Uh, it was attended by 5,000 people from throughout the Arab. The amount of discussions uh, by corporations, uh, and the majority of those people were private sector. Uh, they're looking for investments, they look for trade, they look for opportunities, and have. Uh, so the, the uh, uh, world is wide open. They have already invested over $300 billion in Africa alone, compared to less than 30 in that we have. I think we're around 20, 20 billion in comparison. There's 49 countries in Africa. Yeah. And is that amazing? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was just being generous by allowing for a little bit more than the 20 billion numbers banded about, but they have invested $300 billion. These are not only in mines, they have invested in roads and railroads and ports and uh, uh, airports and variety of, uh, of areas that they have. That basically stimulates uh, stimulates trade, stimulates exchange. So their focus uh, uh, on the kind of things that stimulated uh, the Chinese economy over the last twenty or thirty years is beginning to shift towards the future. Uh, where is the future? It's technology. It's in digital uh, things. There's nothing in China today that you could do uh, by paying cash. You can't even pay cash for a a one dollar lollipop. Uh, everything is digital. Everything is uh, uh, WeChat or Alipay or uh, everything else. You know, you try to take a taxi and you have cash. They don't have change. They don't, they don't even know what that means. Right. So, so the it's... society is very much being transformed in a way that uh, will offset uh, the uh, <laughs> the demographic. And, and by the way, just to comment on that, that for... You know, one important part of, of becoming digital in that manner that uh, there's no cash transactions is that there's no underground economy. So in many countries of the world, we have 20, maybe you can know, think about Chile or all the countries in Latin America, 20, 30% of GDP is going untaxed so that then the government doesn't have the wherewithal to, to invest in the public goods and the education system. So moving in this direction, it, and being the first out of the gate, it's a huge thing, but it's certainly going to lead other countries, I think, who are smart enough to, to follow that lead to, to do so, basically ban cash, make all the transactions reported. So now you can collect sales taxes, value added taxes, income taxes, very important for, for development, economic development. Uh, the U.S. is likely not to do that because there'll be some privacy concerns. Uh, and we, this is another area where we will fall behind uh, China. I don't think the typical American has any, who hasn't been to China, I have been, but not any, anywhere near as often as you have, has any idea about how remarkable the development has been. And I think another aspect of this in terms of the, the, the support of the people is that they see this as a public, they see the public goods as part of their own kind of wealth. And in the U.S., we don't view kind of public goods as yeah, we have our big gated communities. We're into private goods, not into public goods. If we if the airport is, you know, third rate, uh, we don't take a lot of concern about that. But, but if it's first rate in China, it's a pride, a matter of pride. So people are willing to. The, the way this happened was that China's saved at a very high rate. Maybe it's for saving in part, you know, pushing down consumption, taking the surplus and investing it in all these marvelous public, you know, public goods, but uh, uh, also obviously in some military spending. So it's just been a a very directed, uh, methodical, um, you know, top-down development strategy, which hasn't worked uh, everywhere, but certainly I think it's worked 
in China, Korea, South Korea has made amazing strides, Singapore, Hong Kong. And, and Japan earlier. And the issue about savings, uh, uh, I've looked into that. And uh, while I like to see people spend their money and, and whatever, but problems with the countries like China, uh, to some extent, some of the other Asian countries like South Korea, the social safety net, uh, the pension system, the retirement system, whatever, uh, <clears throat> is still not not very highly developed. So when people uh, age, uh, and because of the demographics, you have one child working, supporting basically four grandparents. And, and that becomes a, a real challenge. And until such time as the population pyramid changes, uh, they will uh, <clears throat> they will continue to save because that's uh, that's the only way they can do it. Uh, government doesn't have the resources yet uh, to provide. Them. Right, people are saving uh, at a very high rate, partly because the return they can get through these state banks is low, uh, because uh, and you know kind of poor saving in that and that because the government's taking the surplus that would otherwise maybe be paid in terms of return, but also you don't have adequate health insurance, you don't have adequate pension, you don't know whether these pensions of especially the state owned enterprises are actually going to pay off. So absolutely things could, um, uh, when this country goes from having maybe 10% people over 65 to 39% over 65 without adequate, uh, without the, any kids to really take care of them, uh, that's that's going to be a challenge uh, for the country. So, uh, but um, I don't know. They've thought these things out, and uh, uh, they seem to be able to come up with solutions. So I don't think we should count them out to, on any score on any issue. Uh, well, the advantage they have is that unlike uh, here, where everything is debated uh, on ideological or other grounds, uh, they're able to discuss and debate these issues internally and come up with solutions and they are willing to uh, to pull together without any uh, inefficiencies without any uh, right uh, you know <laughs> issues uh, it takes us it takes us a long time to come to these kind of conclusions uh, i don't know whether it's uh, our age or whatever but uh, i don't remember us having to spend an awful lot of months to debate what infrastructure is <laughs> And uh, whether we should invest in, uh, uh, you know, uh, in new technology that has become very integral part of infrastructure. I'll just give you an interesting example about how technology has changed our life. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I worked uh, with a team of young programmers for <coughs> to, for the Apollo uh, Apollo programs, and we used a computer IBM three hundred and seventy. Uh, which has a 64k <laughs> processor uh, to uh, to uh, send a man to the moon into orbit. Uh, the computers we have today, the iPhones and uh, smartphones, they have uh, they have capacities uh, uh, with giga numbers instead of kilo. Uh, and uh, on my trip to Saudi Arabia, uh, I uh, somehow uh, misplaced my telephones, left them in the restaurant, and came back to my hotel. Uh, without my telephones, uh, and therefore my contacts, my appointments, uh, even ordering a car, an Uber, uh, was all linked to my telephone. And there's nobody I could contact <laughs> to find my uh, my telephones. I I was basically uh, disconnected from the world uh, for a period of almost uh, 18, 20 hours, and I felt helpless and hopeless. <laughs> Uh, until I was able to recover them. And if I didn't recover them, I don't know how I would have even been able to get back home. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, yeah, uh, absolutely the case. The uh, world has changed so dramatically. And uh, uh, certainly, you know, if you look at who's catching up, India and China in terms of per capita GDP, a few other countries, but in large part, it's still, you know, the world is becoming more unequal. Uh, it's not like the world is converging in terms of per capita GDP. It's actually diverging. Uh, so anyway, this has been a fascinating conversation. We obviously haven't resolved any global issues, uh, but we've kind of uh, 
discuss some interesting, uh, you know, some sense now of where, you know, your insight about uh, where China's coming from, where it's likely to to go, um, and the fact that, just to summarize, that it's taking such a big role in Africa and the Middle East, the U.S. is really stepping back from uh, from engaging. Uh, it wasn't a particularly successful experience. Uh, the war in Iraq, the war in, Af war in Afghanistan. Our approach has been to kind of dominate, I guess. Uh, well, obviously we were attacked from the Middle East and we uh, reacted in one way and we might have reacted in more, more intelligently to fight a war in Afghanistan for 20 years and end up uh, leaving in the manner we did uh, and leaving all those people behind who had depended on us. Uh, not, not the first time, though. Not the first time. Yes, yeah, kind of Vietnam deja vu. So um, we'll we just will... close on a positive note, Larry. Mm -hmm. um, so talk about U.S., Middle East, and China. For almost 50 years, since the 1970s, uh, the United States had the Middle East uh, <coughs> field for its own. It had no competition. Uh, <laughs> Nobody fighting it, nobody uh, trying to displace it. And so for the first time uh, in 2022, 2023, uh, the U.S. now faces competition. Uh, it wanted to leave the Middle East because it wanted to focus on, on China. Uh, but now the Middle East has become now a center a, a, uh, for conflict, for competition. I think competition, uh, as an economist, you would agree that uh, it's the best that happens to uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to all parties. Uh, to the extent that the U.S. now faces competition, it probably will be forced to, uh, and would be wise to do, uh, to change and rethink its policy towards, uh, towards the region. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, then we have been handing over a billion people and multi-trillion dollar economies to, to China. So I'm hoping that it's a wake-up call. Uh, it's one that uh, is driven by competition, will bring us into a bit more rational uh, and more intelligent thinking that's not reflex on exerting power and exercising power. Well, um, I, I agree. I, I hope that um, that transpires. And I think that's a good, hopeful note to end the conversation. I want to thank you so much, Hani. Thank you. We'll get you back on to... Uh, to get an update as things progress. Many, so many other things we could have uh, discussed today, Ukraine and uh, the attempted coup and where that is ending, uh, going. Uh, but uh, let's let's stay in touch and we will um, keep uh, focused on, uh, on the future uh, and hopefully it'll be a peaceful one. Thanks again. Thank you so much.